It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 007. And this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Today, I'm joined by Richard Wiswall of Kate Farm in Plainfield, Vermont. Kate Farm has sold produce through a CSA, farmer's market, and wholesale accounts and has been in business since 1981. So Richard's got a wealth of knowledge that he brings to the show today. Richard is also well known for his excellent book, The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. We take a hard look at the business side of vegetable farming with some quick pointers for how you can start to understand cost to production and marketing on your farm to better inform decision making. We also take a look at framing both big picture and day-to-day decisions on your farm. And at the end of the show, Richard tells us his solution for the current hybrid kale seed crisis. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Purple Pitchfork, providing tools and resources to farmers and food businesses to help them succeed in business, farming, and life. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also sponsored by Second Cup Media, helping tiny businesses build old-fashioned relationships using new-fashioned technologies. You can find the Farmer to Farmer podcast on Stitcher and iTunes, where your ratings and reviews are a critical part of moving the show up in the lists and the search results, which helps get the Farmer to Farmer podcast out to more people. We've provided links to the resources that Richard mentions in the show notes. Just go to farmertofarmerpodcast.com and search for Wizwall. Thank you so much for joining me today. And now on to the show. I'm simply thrilled to introduce my guest today, Richard Wizwall. Richard, I've given our listeners just a little bit of an overview, but we'd like to hear from more from you in your own words about your farm and, and its history and, and your history with farming. Can you tell us about the kind of scale that you're operating on, how you grow your crops, where and how you market and how you got into the business? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I've uh, been at Kate Farm here in central Vermont, outside of uh, Montpelier, Vermont, for the last 34 years. And my wife and I co-farm it. We have 22 acres in cultivated land. We have a lot more in woods. And we have seven 96-foot-long greenhouses. And our business has changed over the years. But, you know, we've done everything from doing 18 acres of row crops and six acre or four acres of cover crops plus the greenhouses. We did a CSA during the 1990s for seven years, which we just really love, um, but stopped for different reasons. Uh, I personally did a farmer's market for 25 years, just stopped recently. And we had, again, I should just preface this saying that as I'm getting older, I just don't want to work as hard. And so uh, my wife and I made a conscious decision to grow fewer things and not hire as many people and do as much as we used to do. And so fewer, fewer, a uh, uh, less variety on, and the same number of acres, or when you say fewer things, are you actually shrinking the operation? Um, well, let's see more concentration on the greenhouses. So we're still working full time and still hiring people, but not as many people. And, but definitely less variety. In fact, when, um, one of the decisions to stop the CSA was because our crew chief was going to take a leave of absence um, to have a baby. And we said, well, maybe we'll shave off the CSA in a farmer's market, not have to grow everything all the time. And so then we decided just to concentrate on fewer crops and more of them. And so now we're doing the same kind of thing, except we're just not doing as much. And so when a market opportunity comes along, we might just say no to it instead of sure, taking it on and getting bigger. Right. So, you know, right now our business is, you know, the seven greenhouses of the seven greenhouses. We have two that are used for seedling production for our own use, but mainly to sell to other home gardeners in the area. And then the other five we use for in-ground production of vegetables, uh, three for tomatoes and two for greens. So we can rotate the tomatoes around, not quite every other year, but um, three out of five. Um And then in our fields, we have maybe a couple acres of row crops now instead of, you know, usually we were doing 12 acres or so of mixed vegetables, but no longer that anymore just because it's, um, again, too many balls to juggle in the air. Uh, And so that works out great. So it actually works out very nicely for time wise because we're incredibly busy during the spring. And then once seedlings get done, our greenhouse tomatoes come on. And then once our greenhouse tomatoes start tapering off, our fall root crops come in. And so it's spread out very evenly. And so my wife and I, Sally, can, you know, do most of the work ourselves with some part-time help as well. But, you know, in the old days, we used to hire five full-time people from, you know, April through November, and then maybe somebody during the winter to help out wash, you know, because we store root crops all winter long. 
Um, and now it's, you know, it, it's just less people around. Uh, so it's a little bit smaller business, I guess, to answer your question. Okay. Okay. And do you feel like to get to the smaller business, you had to go through that, that big, expansive, massively diversified, larger operation to get to where you are now? Or no, is that, no, I mean, was that part of building what you have? Uh, no, I think what happened, I, I think it just has to do with age, Chris. I don't know how old you are, <laughs> but, uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm pushing 60 and it's like, you know, I just, you know, I, you know, it's just different because, you know, when I was young, the sky's the limit and I would work long hours and loved every bit of it and would take any number of things on. And just as I get older, you know, I just value my free time more. And so I think, you know, once we reach cruising altitude, you know, maybe, 10 or 15 years into, into it, you know, we're at cruising altitude and think the, the learning curve and the workload lessens off. And so once you're there, you know, we could just keep going along like that, but we decided to actually, you know, lower the altitude a little bit just because we didn't need to keep that pace up anymore. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So no, it's, it's a benefit. I think it's a benefit of, you know, working 34 years, we have a stable full of machinery and seven greenhouses and, you know, three barns and two coolers, you know, we have everything in place, so we don't need to do any of that. So we can just kind of, you know, use the existing equipment very easily. And it's a nice place to be, I must say, you know, it took, it took some work getting here, but, um, you know, for someone starting out, you know, it's definitely a longer road to hoe just because you're still acquiring machinery and building infrastructure and, and learning the ropes as well. Yeah. And of course, it's not just the it's not even just the money that it takes to acquire the machinery, but just the time and, and intellectual energy for for doing all of the things that are required with scaling up, I think, is a real challenge. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's, it's a hard thing when, you know, I talk to new farmers or beginning farmers, you know, and it's like there's so many things you can spend money on and there's so many different directions you can go. And and that's part of the adventure. You know, you just you. you you choose what you want to do. And, you know, I guess my best advice is to do what you want to do and to think about it ahead of time. And, you know, I've always been a proponent of like saying, you know, push a pencil on, even on the back of an envelope, just to see if your farming venture is going to look, you know, financially feasible. And then if so, then move forward, you know, and, you know, you'll never be able to buy everything you want all the time. And, you know, the learning curve is going to be, you know, steep on a lot of things. And that's, Part of the fun of it, too, is learning about how to grow vegetables or herbs or flowers or whatever it is or raise animals uh, and, you know, not to not to look at it as a ch- I mean, look at it as a challenge, but it's a good challenge. Well, and, and you even talked about just in your in your experience on your farm, the changes that you've gone through over the years with the CSA, then the farmer's market. Um, I'm assuming that means some changes in crop mix, having to learn to grow some new things. Um, it, it is, I, I think. You, you never really hit that stasis. And, and even in the 14 years that I own my farm, we were, we, um, I mean, we went through so many different manifestations of what rock spring farm actually looked like. Uh, you know, what crops we were growing on, what crops we were focused on. You kind of have to keep probing and probing and probing and taking advantage of those new opportunities. And um, that's a very good point. And I think that, you know, when, you know, I always think it's a great thing for people to plan ahead, but you know, you think at one point, you're going to go from point A to point B, but then something comes along or the markets change and all of a sudden you kind of go over to one direction and come back again. You might not end up at point B at all and that's okay. Um, Businesses are always in flux and it's rare that you're just going to be doing the same thing year after year after year. Your markets change, your um, ability to grow certain things change, uh, your scale up, it might be different. So all those things, it's a moving target, but what's great about it is that the farmers in control of doing what they want to do and not to be necessarily ruled by the marketplace, but, you know, do what you want to do and, and look for the market to support that. I think it's something interesting about, about your scene out there in Vermont. I was just in, I was just in Vermont last week. I know I missed you. I'm sorry that we didn't connect. I didn't put two and two together. Um, I was actually in Montpelier. So I'm, I'm kind of um, you know, thumping myself on the head going, well, there was a missed opportunity, <laughs> but um, not my first missed opportunity. And I'm sure it won't be my last. We, um, you know, I did two, I did two workshops out there uh, back to back. And I think we had 80 or 90 people at those two 
at those two sessions and about market farming. These were all market farmers. And, and I'm thinking they were an hour and a half apart. I mean, you guys have, you've got some population density there in Vermont, but I mean, you can't, you can't turn around without running into a market farmer. And, and I'm really curious. I mean, how have you, how have you dealt with that? I think a, a lot of markets now, I know in the Twin Cities, we're starting to see like the CSA market is people are talking about it being full. And I've noticed on uh, Simon Huntley's CSA uh, uh, discussion group that he's got on Facebook that that a lot of a lot of farmers there are asking that question. Um, how how did you adapt to that changing market? And I mean, again, you're now you're in this very competitive space that has to be a lot different than where you were in 1980. So like in 19, well, 1981 is our first year. And back then there's very fewer farmers, but the market was much smaller. And so, you know, we had a challenge just to find the market even with fewer growers. And then, you know, over the decades, you know, the market has grown and at certain points very dramatically and other points, not as much to the point where now there's a lot of people coming into a marketplace, which is kind of not growing so much. And so there is a little bit of this, you know, the lowest hanging fruit of the consumers that want to buy organic produce has already been picked. And so if a new grower comes on the scene, a lot of times that marketing pie doesn't really get any bigger. It just gets cut into different sized pieces or smaller pieces. And so, you know, that you're basically a new or not a new grower, growers tend to shuffle customers without actually getting new customers. And I don't think that's really good for everybody. I'm always an advocate of working cooperatively and, you know, pooling resources and trying to work it out so we don't step on our neighbor's toes. I don't mind taking business from California, nothing against California, but, you know, uh, it's just, it, you know, I'd much rather support all our local infrastructure as well as here. That said, you know, there's a lot of people at farmer's market, you know, all selling lettuce and all selling tomatoes and everything else. And so, you know, it all tends to sugar off that we have our own customers or it does sharpen our um, marketing and promotional skills just because we need to do that. But I think there is an issue of, you know, this cannibalism of the consumers that want to buy organic produce. And so what we need to do now is you know, either find and enlarge that marketplace who are getting more people to come to or to buy this food, or we reach out to sell to institutions or, you know, people that may not buy it or to try to find scale where we can maybe sell at a lower price point that we can then, you know, be more competitive in a, in a bigger marketplace. That, you know, right now I'm actually working on this great project through NOFA Vermont, and we teamed up with two other NOFA states about doing cost of production for farmers. So we have 30 farmers in New England here that we're actually working with to determine cost of productions of three crops. Well, we have a list of 10 crops and everybody picks three, so there's a lot of overlap. And, you know, part of it is to shine the light on the inner workings of a business, you know, everything from how much it costs to market their produce through CSA deliveries or, um, or, or farmer's market or farm stand or wholesale and looking at their overhead expenses, but also just to look at how much it really takes to produce a case of squash or a bag of carrots or a bag of beets. And that is, you know, tremendously important. It's like, uh, for people to know what it costs to grow their certain, um, crops that they grow and, and to know if the price that they're getting is actually going to be sufficient enough to make a profit in general, you know, you know, you could look at it saying, well, it costs me, you know, a dollar 25 to grow a head of lettuce. I need to charge $2 a head, but generally there's a price out in the, in the world that says, you know, a head of lettuce goes for a dollar 50 wholesale and two fifty retail say, and right. You know, it's our job as farmers to produce the head of lettuce or whatever it may be under that market price. So then we can, you know, have enough profit left over at the end of the year to support ourselves, pay our employees livable wages, save for retirement, put our kids through college, all that kind of thing. And um, and maybe not work 80 hours a week to, to do it. So the idea um, with this cost of production project is you know, we're kind of uncovering these, you know, profit centers that could be on your farm. And, you know, a, diverse, a diversified vegetable farm may grow 30 different crops or maybe more, and they might right. have animals as well. And, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces on a farm like that. And, 
the best thing to do, you know, when that's happening is to basically take, you know, your top one to five sellers, take your top five sellers and analyze the profit, profitability of those because that's what's bringing the most money into your bank account. You better be making money on those or you could be hemorrhaging money. Um, and the idea that if you do more than one thing, if you're not just growing 10 acres of carrots, but if you're doing 10 different vegetables or five species of animals, I can guarantee you that they're not equal profitability. I mean, it's just, there's no way it would be. And so of those, you know, you want to focus on the ones that are more profitable or find out the ones why things aren't profitable and either raise the price or try to lower expenses or both. I, I know that in my operation, we had, we did carrots and beets. We did a lot of storage crops and, and we were famous for our carrots. People loved Rock Spring Farm carrots and it was a fun crop to produce. You know, we'd, we had, I, we had a girl one time at farmer's market who started crying because we'd run out of carrots before her family got there. You know, and that's, I didn't feel good about making her cry, but I felt good about my carrots and, and nobody gets that excited about beets. But when we actually sat down and, and ran some numbers on what our costs were, you know, we found out that those carrots were, they were they were a very successful crop from the customer standpoint, but we were barely breaking even on selling carrots in the wholesale marketplace. Whereas with beets, we, we, our cost of weeding was lower and the cost of washing was so much lower that we were, we were making bank on those. Right. And it was, it was, but of course, I mean, who wants to be, I mean, suddenly I was Dwight Schrute being a, a beet farmer, you know, and who wants to do that? Well, I think, and beets don't break. I mean, it's really hard to break yes. a be beet in the washer, <laughs> but that's a great example. And I use the example of broccoli and kale, which are very identical right. crops, you know, and, you know, they, you know, pretty much the same uh, planting, I mean, same planting, spacing and fertility, spray schedule, all those kind of things. But the difference in profitability between the two is dramatic. Broccoli, you might you probably won't even get uh, one head per plant. Um, and that's in a good pick and yet kale, you might get three to four bunches per plant. The difference being is that the kale is so much more profitable than broccoli. And yet there's much more market demand for broccoli. And so just because people may be screaming for broccoli or carrots or say sweet corn, doesn't mean that we should be growing it if it's not profitable. And, you know, granted with your carrots and beets example, you know, it's great that you have both, but if carrots were unprofitable, then you have to either raise their price or lower expenses, or, you know, I, I would just say stop growing it if you can't or do that. Growing them. Yeah. You know, and the yeah. whole thing about, you know, people say, well, I, I do it as a loss leader. And, you know, I really challenge people on the loss leader concept because if you're intentionally trying to lose money or knowingly lose money, you had better be really having an effect on the sales of the things that are making money because otherwise you're, it's, you know, a, a downward spiral and you should look at that loss leader as, you know, maybe more of a promotional cost of advertising or, you know, maybe better spent on radio ads or, you know, newspaper ads or whatever. But it's a cost, that's a more of a cost of doing business for you to, bring something to market that, is, you know, is a lost leader and then it sells out by nine o'clock at market, you know, the next four hours, you know, it's not doing any good. It's just a hole in your, in your business operation. I, I, I make the analogy oh. of, you know, if you're in a canoe at one end of a lake and you're trying to get to the other and you have, you know, a paddle in one hand and a portable drill with a drill bit on the end of it. And, you know, you take one paddle and then you take your drill and you drill a hole in the bottom of your boat. Then you take another paddle and you drill another hole, hole in the bottom of your boat. It's really simple. Just drop the drill, put both hands on the paddle and you'll get to where you want to go so much quicker. And, you know, if, again, if you can plug those leaks up, you know, your business all of a sudden starts floating and you become, you have more money to invest in your infrastructure. You have more money to pay yourself, to pay your employees. It's just such a win-win situation. And the only downside is you have to do a little math. You know? <laughs> okay. So, but, but Richard, I mean, you know, you know this, and I mean, you, you and I both make a portion of our living going out and talking to people about, about record keeping and you know, and, and, and math. And those are hard things to do when you're already working 80 hours a week. That's true. And, you know, truth be told, I don't like record keeping any more than anybody else. And that kind of sounds strange coming from a guy that, you know, you know, talks about it and talks and wrote a book about it, but I only keep records 
to the extent that I need to so that I can enjoy the life that I do by making more money doing what I love to do, farming. And so I've kind of really come to, and I think you do the same thing, is to promote taking fewer numbers, but, you know, very good numbers. And so I, I, you know, always advise people to say, you know, instead of, so when, sometimes when I give a workshop, people get so excited about taking care of their financial destiny. They go home, they say, great, I'm going to start tracking everything I do all day long, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I'm going to track everything every one of my employees does. And so they do that. And, you know, thinking that that's going to be their salvation for financial um, success. And by doing that, they get these reams of paperwork. And then at the end of the year, they start looking at it. Some is incomplete and it's kind of disjointed and it gets overwhelming. And all of a sudden the whole process stops and they throw their arms up in frustration. And that's not the intended result. And so what I do now is say, um, just focus on, again, the top five sellers of your business. Don't go to whole hog and compare those and focus on the rates that it takes to do things. So the biggest thing in a crop budget that is missing is the labor that happens during the season. All the other things like buying the beet seed or carrot seed and the fertilizers and the remay and the bags that they're going to get shipped in, all those things have a paper trail. You can easily figure that out. Um, but what you don't have a record of and and, and very hardly anybody has a record of is how long it actually takes you to seed the crop, weed the crop, cultivate the crop, irrigate it, harvest it and pack out. And those are the numbers you need to do in season. And say the most complicated thing would be if you had weekly plantings of salad mix, you know, 22 different plantings every single week. And you wanted to track the profitability of that or do a crop budget, you could say, well, I'm going to track you know, planting one, planting two, planting three, planting four. Instead of doing that, you just take two plantings, you know, one in the beginning, one in the middle of the season, and you just see how long it takes to seed it, write it down, and then see how long it takes to weed it, how much to pick it, how much to wash, and how much to bag it. And so then you do that, you check it again, and then maybe a third time. And those rates, I can almost, you know, unless the pick is really bad, those rates are going to be very similar. And once you do that, you don't have to track all 22 plantings. Well, you have a pretty good idea of how what your rates are for washing, packing, harvesting, and um, and weeding. And right. then you have a really some cogent information, and it doesn't take that long. And a lot of information that you take, say, for every budget, which might be, you know, pre-plant disking and fertilizing and bed prep, those are going to be the same no matter what you plan. You know, it's like it's so a lot of the work is just in the, you know, the things that are crop specific, which is weeding and picking and pack. And those usually are the biggest numbers that affect the budget. Surprisingly, the ones that we don't know anything about are the things that affect the budget the most, which are, you know, usually weeding and harvest and pack out. Uh, and the other thing that affects the budget the most is the price of that yield. So a small increase in the price, if a 10% increase in the uh, sales price directly translates to an increase in your net profit because right, all expenses are remaining the same. You've just, you know, with a little pen or a keystroke on your keyboard, all of a sudden made another $10,000 on, you know, five acres. So it's pretty amazing how that works. And I think it's that that pricing piece is something that I think a lot of folks underestimate. Um, you know, you talked earlier about selling out at farmer's market and, and my attitude was always that if I sold out at farmer's market, I was basically leaving money on the table because that meant I could have charged a higher price for every unit that I sold. Cause I still had to be at farmer's market for another three hours after selling out of something at nine o'clock. And there was just no sense in doing that. That's true. Or you could have brought more. I mean, I don't want right. to be a capitalist pig dog shyster and chart, you know, charge an arm and a leg. So it's only the very wealthy can afford my produce. I think we all want to have our produce affordable to everyone. And yet we still want to make money. I mean, that's the win-win and it's, that's a hard, you know, position to be in sometimes. But I guess, again, 
it's the internal knowledge of your own farm business to know what is making money that allows you to still price things in the marketplace that isn't that far off and still make money. Kale is a great example. And again, kale, you know, even at $2 a bunch, you are going to probably net, you know, $15,000 an acre on, on kale, you know, and $2 a bunch is probably cheaper than the commercial grocery store down the street. I'm buying it for two fifty right, right now. So exactly. So, you know, those kind of things, you know, is that internal knowledge of your own business allows you to make decisions that will shape your business in a much more profitable way. So Richard, how, how did you end up getting into the business side of things? Cause it sounds like you, like most, most of us that got into this business didn't, didn't get in because you enjoyed the bookkeeping. You didn't get in because you wanted to, you wanted to be a pencil pusher. You got in cause you like growing vegetables. And at some point you became, you know, essentially the business guru of the market farming world. So how, how did that happen? Well, I got kind of dragged in kicking and screaming into the business world only out of sheer necessity and frustration. Um, but once I did get dragged into the business world, I, I, you know, a light bulb went off on me and said, wow, now I get it. And the reason that happened was because I, well, before I, when I first started out at the Kate farm here, I was a 5% owner in a partnership of five individuals. And so basically I rented the farm from that partnership and I paid an annual rent, but I could, you know, make or lose any money in my sole proprietorship, um, independently. And that allowed me to grow my business without this huge mortgage over my head. And, you know, it, after 12 years of doing that, I actually had a track record. I had, you know, substantial sales and, you know, a proven business. And so then I could go to the bank and I borrowed $190,000 to um, buy the other partners out at that point. Um, it, that's when I read the, you know, the rubber met the road in terms of, you know, finances, because not only did I have to prove to the loan officer that I could pay the money back. But more importantly, I had to prove it to myself because I was putting everything on the line. And if I screwed up, I lost the farm, you know, which was, you know, blood, sweat and tears, you know, and a lot of hopes and dreams. And so that's when I really said, okay, I need to figure out how to do this. And it was, you know, the same time I'd taken a holistic management course, which kind of opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And it was then that I realized that I didn't have these numbers that I needed, these numbers in season. And that's when I started to keep the the crop journal. And it's really the most important book on my farm. And it's just most rudimentary book too. It's like, all it is is a pocket folder with some loose leaf paper in it. And I just have a page for each crop. And so when I, you know, uh, seed the beets. I just write seeded, you know, 10th of an acre of beets and, you know, half an hour. And then I went, you know, I might not go into the beet field for another two weeks and then I'll go and I'll run the baskets over it. And I'll say, you know, um, cultivated with baskets, uh, half an hour, 45 minutes. And, and I, I keep doing that, you know, and that's every, everything that I do on that beet field is in one page, you know, it's not a lot. It's just done over the whole season. And that's what the information that I needed to actually figure out how much was making money and what wasn't, because those were the actual costs that were going into um, the crop budget. So that's what kind of got me into thinking that way. But then, so then back, you know, at that time, this is 1993, that I was growing 40 different crops, 43 different crops. And I rated them in terms of profitability. So I did an enterprise budget for each one of them. And I read it in terms of profitability. And most all were positive, but some were much more positive than others. And so what I did, I just kind of went halfway down the list and I just drew a line through it. And I stopped growing the bottom half, kept growing the top half, the more profitable ones. And all of a sudden, my net income rose dramatically for doing, and every, anybody on the outside looking at my business said, well, Richard's not doing anything different. He's still going to a farmer's stand. He's going, still going to farmer's market, has a CSA, ships to deep root, you know, does a lot of wholesaling. You, know, nothing, you, know, you wouldn't really see it on the outside, but it was my crop selection that determined, you know, how profitable I became. And, all, and it was like, that's when the light bulb started going off and go like, wow. And all of a sudden I realized you can make some pretty good money doing this. And 
there's a few things that, you know, people would say, well, how come you don't have sweet corn at farmer's market or CSA or um, peas and beans or some of the things that I actually dropped? And, you know, I, I explained to people, I said, you know, sweet corn, you know, I love sweet corn, but you know, you can only gross, you know, $1,200 an acre and, you know, to keep it weed free, it's going to cost, you know, a certain amount. And then right before I pick it, you know, the crows come in, the raccoons come in, the deer come in and my neighbors are picking it as well. So, you know, it's, right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was a loser. And I said, listen, I cannot make money growing corn. And I, I, I don't, I can't do that. I go buy corn from my neighbor and I encourage you to do the same. Most CSA members in farmer's market go to the store to buy avocados and coffee and chocolate and other things that, you know, you can't grow up here. And so, you know, right. they would have to buy it somewhere else. And, and explaining to your customer is, you know, having that uh, you know, ability to have that audience is a huge thing because they say, sure, I, I hear you. And they're great. And they're very happy with their, your lettuce and spinach and tomatoes and um, everything else that they're getting. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned deep root co-op and, and I think this is always a, this is a hard thing to capture too, when you're doing uh cost of production, is it, you know, when, when we've got a, a, a market farm, you've essentially got this big vertically integrated operation, right? You, you, you're growing your own transplants, your, which, which is one way of doing business. You're, you're selling, you're growing stuff out in the field and that's got a whole nother set of costs and structure to it on kind of that per acre or per square foot basis. And then you've got the, the washing and the packing, you know, out in California, all these are handled by different elements when you're, when you're on a very large farm in California. And then you turn around and do the sales and, you're talking about selling through a farmer's market to a CSA and th through deep root, um, what deep root, is it deep root co-op? Deep, um, deep root organic co-op is a growers co-op that's been around since 1985 and it's growers in Vermont and some over the border in Quebec now that pool, they, they, we started the, to form the co-op back in the eighties. So we would ship produce out of state so we wouldn't compete with each other, but we would satisfy the needs in Boston, New York and Washington or the Eastern seaboard. And so we would right. take, you know, take produce out of Vermont to, to basically, so we wouldn't compete in state for uh, the same marketplace. And that worked. And it's a great model for doing business because, you collaborate, you look at a market need for what the Boston market might need through their um, bigger stores like Whole Foods and, you know, um, say, okay, they need, you know, four pallets of green leaf a week, you know, who's going to grow it. And so, okay, Chris, you grow it in June, I grow it in July and another farmer grows it in August. And, you know, we can, we cooperatively, you know, kind of put our efforts into doing that and then cooperatively, um, you know, take a percentage of sales to pay for a manager and trucking. And now we even have our own warehouse that we've paid for. So it's a great uh, model for selling. It does take some time in terms of running a co-op just because you have different people in it. You know, there is that, that's the one, I wouldn't tell it downside, but you have to spend time managing the business. And of course it's a scale thing too. You've got to, you when you're running a co-op like that, you're obviously not selling to say the, the food co-op in Montpelier, which is, I mean, you could, relatively and they do, but they don't, right. they don't, they don't do it to, um, take business away from their own members, obviously. And it's, um, and it's obviously it's, not your only market either. You're, you're taking this to a much larger, you know, like you said, you're heading out, out of Vermont, which has a population of 600,000 people Right. Total in and, Vermont, you know, and, and deep root can ship two or three tractor trailer loads a week, you know, down into the Boston market. You know, that's a which lot. Which probably has what, two or three million people, right? In the Boston market? That I'm not positive, you know. Okay. Deep root sales are okay. like two and a half million a year. Um, and, the, right. and, but you don't have to be, you can be a grower of any size at all, you know, or your number of crops or just one crop it doesn't make any difference. Okay. We all work together. So is that some, how long has that been around? Since 1985. So that's uh, oh. coming on 30 years. And, yeah. you know, the, the thing about marketing is, you know, I think, you know, farmer's markets are kind of sexier because you're out there, you know, dealing with a customer one-on-one. -on -one. Same thing with CSAs, you know, you, you're, you know, the farmers, you know, are kind of the, you know, sometimes a rock star of the community and they get more recognition in that retail aspect. But if you were to look at your business and see how much money you're spending on your marketing as a percentage of gross, that 
or as a per, even per acre basis, you know, it's going to be dramatic. It's going to be a dramatic difference. Or it'll just be eye opening to see how much money you actually spend on marketing. So if you were to pay yourself 12 or $15 an hour to, to set up and staff a CSA and pack it up, plus all the time that you do promoting it and getting members, or all the time that you go to farmer's market, so you load up the farmer's market, you attend for four hours, come back, you know, it's an eight hour day, maybe two people, you know, you add up all those hours. Generally, you don't add them up because you're not paying yourself and you don't um, count them. But, you know, if you didn't, if you break a leg or have to get called off for a wedding or a funeral or something, you do have to pay somebody and that's a real cost of doing business. And, and farmers should figure that their time is worth as much as their, their crew rate, at least I would think. Um, so, you know, there is a cost of doing business. And so if you're to look at all your different marketing channels, whether farmers market, CSA, farm stand or wholesale, it's going to cost you something. And, you know, the wholesale, you might not get the same sales price, but pretty much you're talking about a phone, a 30 second phone call and either delivery or get picked up at your door. That's your only cost. So you might get 20 percent less for that service. But in the in the end, it might be a wash if you're to sell it at a higher price with a higher marketing costs, which which is, of course, why a grocery store charges more money to sell produce at retail than they than they pay you for the produce that they're buying from you at wholesale. That's right. And, and, yeah. and that's just, you know, that's the way the world works. And, you know, as long as everybody on the food chain is happy, so the producer can sell at a price that they make money to a store that can buy it and still mark it up so the consumer can still feel like it's uh, uh, affordable food, everybody wins, you know, and that's the goal. I mean, I'm a, you know, again, I'm a cooperative person and I, I'm bullish on farming and I'd like to see everyone succeed. And part of that's, you know, working together, but also just understanding that, you know, we as farmers have to see the end that we have to live in a, in a, in a world that the consumer can still afford or can, will still buy the food, not afford it, you know, that they will still purchase that product at the end. And, you know, we shouldn't blame the middle person to say, oh, they mark it up 40 percent, you know, and that's why we can't make any money. No, that's just the way the world works and, and part of the cost of doing business. Richard, I'm going to break in here for a quick word from our sponsors. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Second Cup Media, a website design and marketing firm run by Christy Waits and Thomas Ponick. They've worked in the technology field for nearly 20 years, and they love sharing their knowledge and expertise with tiny business owners, including farmers. I've worked with these guys a lot over the last six months, and I can tell you that their business rests on two fundamental principles, simple plus personal. A key part to maintaining a tiny business in today's big world is knowing how to cultivate strong and lasting relationships with customers and, and understanding the value of establishing a good conversation. Building a tiny business isn't all about balance sheets and bookkeeping. It's about keeping people engaged long enough for that second cup. The world is changing. The economy is changing. Businesses are changing. But most importantly, people are changing. Their expectations are changing. Bigger, better, and faster is no longer sustainable, and it's no longer necessarily the best way to stay in business. But tiny is. Tiny businesses are built on a solid foundation of slow growth, strong relationships, and manageable tasks. And Second Cup Media can help www.secondcupmedia.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by Purple Pitchfork, where Chris Blanchard, that's me, provides consulting, coaching, and information resources to farmers, food businesses, and the organizations that support them. I draw on over 25 years in the organic farming business to provide down-to-earth solutions to beginning and experienced farmers around North America. Whether you're just getting started in farming or you've been doing it for most of your life, it's worth keeping in mind that even seasoned professionals can use an outside perspective to bring out their best performance. I've assisted farmers with employee management, business planning, food safety assessments, packing house design, marketing strategies, you name it. Um, I've got experience on farms with from a half to 100 acres, and I think that I bring the knowledge and the approaches that you need to improve your farm, your business, and your life. I don't specialize in silver bullet, bullet solutions, okay? and I don't promise that you'll always like what you hear, but I do have a record of creating real results on real farms, www.purplepitchfork.com. I'd like to circle back to, to holistic management. Um, you mentioned that you took a, a holistic management course, I think in 1993 yeah. and, and it's, 
there was a lot going on in the early 90s with holistic management. I know a lot of people out here in the Midwest were were taking classes and getting uh, going into some deeper training at that time. I think it was very popular in the in the Northeast. And and you said that that influenced your how you were looking at, at your farm uh, as in terms of as, as a business. Um, in addition to being a lifestyle enterprise. And, and I wonder if you could, are you still, would you consider yourself to be a holistic manager, holistic management practitioner? I wouldn't say I'm an active manager. I still use the concept. So I guess yes and no. But um, the, the whole thing about holistic management is that it was a different way of kind of looking at my business. And I think the first thing that changed for me was to go through a process of setting a holistic goal of something that was value based, where it met my core principles, you know, and addressed them and said, you know, this is what I want to do. And then you address it. How are you going to do it? You know, what kind of, you know, how are you going to structure your business in order to meet these, these goals? My goal, you know, had nothing to do with farming. It had to do with, you know, having a economic security with a family that's, you know, with family around and being able to have time to do other things that um, were enriching to my life. It had nothing to do with farming. But then, you know, another part of this goal is that, okay, well, how are you going to achieve this goal? And and my vehicle was through farming. And so then I figured, well, how am I going to do this through, you know, how am I going to make this happen through farming? And that's, again, when I started, you know, uh, kind of crunching numbers to see how I was going to be able to support this. And, it, you know, it's a very good, I mean, I, I recommend it to anyone to look into holistic management. It's... Uh, you know, a different way of looking at the biological systems and the economic systems. And they have ways of, you know, kind of testing decision making to see if it covers, you know, the social and economic and environmental aspects that are always there, but sometimes don't get addressed. That whole idea, I think holistic management calls it the testing questions is something that I've run into in a, in a number of different formats. I've, I've had a lot to do with nonprofit organizations over the years and they've got, um, you know, which means you have to do strategy sessions. And, and one of the things that, that has come out of that work in recent years, uh, to a large degree is, is having a set of questions that you always ask about any decision, you know, and I, and I really like that idea in holistic management, kind of having these always be aware of, I think it's seven things and I, I can't rattle them off the top of my head. But when I went through the uh, holistic management training in, in the late nineties, that became an important part of kind of forcing myself into that mode of thinking for a couple of years, helped me to be more aware of those questions without having to whip out my note card and look at those seven questions every time. It was kind of always things that are sort of integrated in the way you think about, uh, the way you think about what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? That's right. And I think that's one of the, it's a nice benefit of the whole holistic management training is, you know, getting that broader view of everything that needs to get addressed. Was that something that a lot of people were doing in, in Vermont in the 1990s? Is that, um, did you, did you find out here? It seems to have in, in the Midwest, it seems to have shifted the way whole groups of people were thinking about their farm operations and their, their involvement in the community and the importance of, of kind of developing a, um, well, I, to use the holistic management language to developing a resource base that was going to support them into the future. Was that something that you saw also happening in Vermont? I think it's a, in the early nineties, there was definitely an uptick in the number of people that were, um, you know, interested in holistic management. But, you know, again, I'm not, I, I haven't kept abreast with what's going on. So I don't know if it's, if the level is the same, um, but there was like in the, in the nineties, there's, you know, a lot of people that were, um, you know, signing on and incorporating it into their business practice and it still happens now. So again, I'm not one to speak, um, you know, if it's still as popular as it was. Okay. Okay. So you said that, that, I mean, it sounds like in the last, you know, probably 10 to 15 years, there've been a lot of changes on your farm, kind of moving, moving out of the CSA uh, into more of a farmer's market and wholesale model. Uh, now moving out of the farmer's market to where you're 
you're you're not just selling to deep roots, right? You're doing deep roots and then I assume direct deliveries to to stores and restaurants in your area. Correct. So basically we sell to deep root um, fall crops during the fall and winter. And then we have um, the local co-op and stores that we sell uh, seedlings and tomatoes to and greens um, locally. And then we're, we don't do any retail anymore except for some plant sales in the spring when we open up our greenhouses on the weekend in May just to, um, so local people can come and buy plants if they want to without us delivering them to uh, retail locations. And that's, you know, that's worked out, that kind of model has worked out well for us. Um, you know, the CSA, again, you know, we had a CSA going for six years in the 90s and really loved it. It was a huge, I mean, I think that's the greatest, one of the greatest business models for selling things. But for us, it necessitated growing everything all the time. And that's why when we stopped to do that, we ended up, you know, saying, well, maybe the model, the CSA model is not what we want to be pursuing right now. Now, I mean, even back then there was multi-farm CSAs, which I think, um, you know, work great because that way you don't have to grow everything all the time. You can specialize in fewer crops and become very good and efficient at doing that. And so, you know, you might even have farms that, you know, can be very, can be profitable growing the things that I found that were unprofitable just because of either scale or technologies that allow them to do that. And, you know, the farmer's market is, you know, I think, I think it was hard for us to shift after 25 years of going to farmer's market. It was actually hard for us to stop just because, um, you know, it's part of, it was part of our being, you know, and we have customers that, you know, we've been seeing weekly for 25 years. It was a hard decision to make. Um, and I miss that, but I also like my Saturday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> it really, it was one of the biggest changes in my life when I stopped doing farmer's market and, and, and had those Saturdays back. It was like, whoa. Yeah. Well, it's not only <laughs> Saturdays, it's all day Friday picking all day Saturday, loading, unloading, vending, loading, unloading. And so by Saturday afternoon, I was exhausted. And so, you know, even though there might be dinner parties or whatever to go to, we'd just be tired. We, you know, you end up doing a lot of chit chat at um, farmer's market that the last thing you want to do on a Saturday night is be doing more of that. Um, so, you know, for me, you know, it's all good. I enjoy doing it and, and, but I do enjoy having some more free time just in general by not doing as much. And again, I'm just getting older, Chris. <laughs> it's yeah, what happens. Well, it's okay. It, it happens. <laughs> it happens. And, and, and things, things change. Um, you know, it, and it's interesting because I think, I think that you're, well, again, I, I feel like I'm seeing more and more farms kind of following that lead. People that have, have kind of, uh, followed that arc through, um, you know, intensive retail only to doing retail and some wholesale and then actually gradually backing out of, of the retail. And I'm, and I'm, I'm always interested if that's something that's, that's indicative of, um, uh, the changes in the marketplace, a maturation of the food system, or if that, if that does have more to do with, with simply getting older and having changes in priorities and changes in energy levels. Well, I think farmer's market is a lot more, that's the retail aspect of a farmer's market is much more, um, ener energy intensive or it just takes more energy to do than if you have a farm stand, you know, there's plenty of farms in Vermont um, all over the place that are multi-generational because they've developed a business and, you know, it's an easier way of retailing than to basically set up a store every Saturday or two or three times a week to basically, you know, move, set up, unpack and all that. Um, and so I don't know if it necessarily has to do with age. You know, I think it has to do with your situation. If you have an ability to have a farm stand, if you have a good location on a roadside or whatever, that that would work fine. And I, I, you know, if we had a farm stand location that was on a bit busy road, that's probably what we'd, we'd be doing and still be doing it. Right. Right. So just to take a different tack from the marketing and the, and, and talking about the, the financial side of things, I had a, I had somebody ask me recently how, um, and, and I didn't have a good answer for this. So I'm going to put this on you. Um, the, and, and this was when you've got, uh, too many things to do on the farm. And the example that this woman gave is, you know, I've, I've got to get crops harvested 
for farmer's market tomorrow, but I also need to cultivate the carrots because today is the day that's the right day to get that done. How, how do you make decisions in a, in a scarce resource environment? I think you're probably having less of that now, but you certainly have, you know, 30 years of experience with that up until now with, you know, being pulled in multiple directions at once, um, having to satisfy both tomorrow's needs as well as the needs for a crop that's going to be ready to harvest two months from now. How do you, how do you decide what to do in, in, on a day-to-day basis, on an hour-to-hour basis? That's a great question. And the reality is, especially with the farming, unless you just don't bite off as much, you're never going to get everything done. You're always going to have a to-do list that is can be never-ending. And by the time you finish something off, you're adding three more at the bottom of it. And so the idea is that, well, a few things. One is effective management is basically getting the most important things done first and following through to make sure they get done. And part of that involves just, it seems so simple, right? You know, all you do is you take all the things you have to do, you prioritize them in the order that they have to get, you know, top to bottom priority and just start going down the list, doing the most top priority things first and just keep working down as you do it. Unfortunately, sometimes you're not enough hours in a day to get that done or the week to do that. And so, you either have to either hire more people in or you just have to make some sacrifices saying, well, we're not going to get to the weeding to the carrots. That said, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, are not on that, you know, the to-do list that have to get done, but things that should get done, which might be long-term planning or looking at, you know, how to, you know, be more efficient at certain things that actually take some maybe a uh, half a day of a meeting with your crew or your spouse to talk about some deeper issues, but we're too busy, you know, weeding the carrots or getting ready for market. And so a lot of times I find it helpful to map out your work week to saying, okay, certain things in your work week are pretty dictated already. If you have a Saturday farmer's market, you're spending Saturday at farmer's market, you're spending Friday picking if you're doing wholesale, you're going to be picking Monday and Thursday for Tuesday, Friday deliveries, say, you know, you might reserve Sunday afternoon or Sunday as a day off, you know, so all of a sudden your calendar on your week starts to get blocked out with things that you're already having to do. So it's good to see that. And so then you only may have, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday and Fridays to do the farm work that you need. And so you plan that out and say, okay, well, these are the days that we have to do all our planting, all our weeding and all our um, irrigating or whatever it might be. And by doing that, well, you know, by having that kind of calendar base, you be, then you might just, it's a matter of staffing to say, okay, well, if, you know, one crew person is going to be delivering only two to be picking on that same day, I'll need to have some more people in here to do the things that need to get done. And, you know, labor management's a tough one because sometimes it, it, you know, it rains for three days and, you know, we don't have enough things to do. But, and that's a challenge, but I think in terms of not having enough things to do, having too many things to do, then it's a matter of either hiring in people to do that or doing less or putting off things that you can, you know, like fixing a a slow leak in your tire until wintertime. And so you just end up pumping it up once a week or something like that. Not the most efficient thing, but you can do that until you, you know, until you have more time. And, you know, obviously when you hire somebody, the goal is you have too much work that you can do. So you think that when you hire somebody, you're going to be able to get this exact same, you'll get twice as much done by having somebody work. But generally that's not the case because you have to train them and, they yeah, might not do it the same way you did it. and But even still, you know, you will get more done. And the thing about employee management, as I'm sure you're aware, Chris, is that, you know, it takes time. And that a lot of times when I have people working for me, I don't get the things done that I want to because I'm making sure that they're, they have all the things in place for them to do their job. It really is. I think a lot of times with the, you know, we think of, of employees as being, well, if you do a classic organization chart, employees end up being underneath us as farmers. And I almost think 
it's almost a more effective visualization to to put yourself on the bottom holding up your employees because that's a lot of what you end up doing that is making sure that they've got what they need that's right and that's yeah. and because you want to make sure they're not hung up with a missing part or not having enough bands to bunch the broccoli or whatever it might be you know unless you assign that job that's your job is overall management of the farm in fact you, the farmer's job really is to make sure your farm succeeds financially and ecologically and um, socially. But, you know, if you look at your farm job as a manager, that's what you do. If you don't do your job well, then your farm fails and you don't have any farm anymore. And that's and that's why I promote the business end is because that's really your job one as a farmer is to make sure your business succeeds or you don't have a farm anymore. Um, and so in employee management, the same way is that you want to make sure that your employees um are doing productive work for their paid time and paid time is work time. And you'd like to pay them as much as possible so they can make a living wage as long as you can still make your farm finances work. So you can make a living wage win, win, which, which again, I think is one of those points. If you, if you really have an understanding of your cost of production, that actually puts you in a better position as a, you know, if, if we wanted to call it a social justice perspective to, to really be able to maximize what you're providing back to your employees in compensation for their labor. Whereas if you don't know what your costs are, you're, you're stuck in a reactive mode of always having to, to squeeze down on those rates of pay as much as possible because you're, you're not, um, because you're not certain that what you actually, what you've got those employees doing is actually yielding a return. That's going to be enough to be able to compensate them for their time. That's a very good point. And I think, um, well, a couple of things. One is that labor is often the single largest item in your expense um, budget. You know, it could be a third or 40, a third or maybe 40 percent of your gross sales. And, you know, that's a chunk of change. That doesn't mean that you should pay people less. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you should uh do anything differently. You just acknowledge the fact that, okay, well, farming is a labor intensive business. That's fine. The other thing is if a farmer is not looking at their business as much as could be, and they're not paying themselves that much, the last thing they're going to do is pay somebody else, you know, if want to feel generous and paying somebody else. It's when the farmer starts understanding that they can make money farming, that's when they can say, oh, I'm happy to share that with my employees who work hard to, for the success of the farm. And so it's hard to, you know, you know, to have a farmer, you know, who's struggling to say, sure, I'll pay everybody a living wage when he's not even paying him or herself a living wage. So what have you found in, in your years of having, I assume a wide variety of, of, types of people and personalities working on your farm. What have you found to be the best ways to increase the effectiveness of your employees? Because that's obviously the other thing is, you, you know, for every, you, you would like to get as much out of them in terms of output as possible for every dollar that you're putting into it, regardless of what your rate of pay is. I think a lot of it's communication and the basic understanding that they get paid by the hour I mean, they could get paid by the piece, but we pay by the hour. And so they get paid by the hour, but we get paid by the piece. We get paid for every head of cabbage that gets sold or every carrot that gets sold, you know, and that difference between getting paid by the piece and getting paid by the hour, the understanding is that there are certain rates that um, employees that everybody does to maintain so that we can get paid by the piece and still make money so they can make their paycheck and that we can pay them. And so understanding that paid time is work time, that there's certain levels of production, that these certain rates are expected because we need to make it work. And, and once you start doing crop budgets and realizing you need to be able to pick um, seven bushels of carrots in an hour, you know, because that's what you're, you know, you've been basing it on. You can convey that to your crew and say, Hey, listen, we need to, you know, we'd like to be able to pick seven bushels of crate of, of carrots an hour because that's what, you know, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work, you know, and, and people understand that and they say, sure. And they might even be challenged to pick eight, you know, but, you know, or pick more. And if it's a bad pick, they might only pick six, 
that's okay. But it's, they understand that's the nature of the exchange. I like that. And that's just, and that's another advantage. This is something I found with record keeping in general is that usually you can leverage it to get more out of it than what you think you're going to get out of it. You know, so you go in saying, I mean, I'm going to do a crop budget and you also end up with a, um, with a management tool. You end up with something to be able to say to people, this is the rate that you're, that we, that is the standard for Kate farm or the standard for rock spring farm is this many bunches of kale an hour, this many bushels of, ca- of carrots an hour. And, and that's a good management tool for being able to establish those expectations with people. That's true. And, and, and besides that, you know, that's a good point that, you know, that's a benefit of doing crop budgets or an ancillary benefit. The other benefit is that, you know, managerially I tend to have employees work in blocks. And so instead of having four different people do four different things, I have four people all weed carrots. And then they say, okay, four people times two hours is eight hours. And then they move on to weeding the beets and they record as one person's recording this. And so it's easier to track time because everybody's working, you know, together, or you have two teams of two say doing the same thing. One person's responsible for weeding and And that's a direct effect of having crop budgets instead of just um, because you're pooling everybody together. Plus, I think it's more fun to work together for the most part um, if there's enough work to do. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, Richard, so um, something new that we're going to that we're that we're trying to do. And I I probably should have given you a heads up about this at the beginning of the show. But I I didn't. I apologize for that is is to have, you know, three questions at the end that we'd like to ask uh, every one of the guests here on the, on the show. And, and, and so the, the first one of these is, is uh, tell us what's, what's your favorite tool on the farm? If you, if you could, if you had to spend the rest of your life on a desert Island with just one tool, what would it be? Boy, that is like such a hard question. You should have given me like five days to think about that, Chris. Sorry, Richard. (laughs) (laughs) Well, boy. That is a tough one. Of well, a desert island wouldn't be a good. Uh, no, tip, it wouldn't. But, but um, <laughs> of the things you that knew what I meant. That so. I really like that save a lot of your know, that are very cost effective. I think you know one would be a trolley for the greenhouse moving around the plants. I think the other tool that I really like, if I can say two, would be the a mini chisel plow, which are the, these um, things that just kind of rip, you know, 12 to 14 inches of soil underneath where the plant is going to be planted. Um, those are probably some of my two, one ground tool and one uh, greenhouse tool. Okay. I'm going to think about that though, and I'll call you back in a week. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have the, we'll have the, we'll have the Richard Wiswall supplemental. Yeah, that's right. that. <laughs> okay. So, um, the, the, the next question is what, what would you tell if, 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 if yourself now could tell yourself when you started farming one thing that would have made, made a difference, what, what would you go back and tell that beginning self? I think one of the things about everyone starting out is that I think maybe they want to achieve a certain level of either farming or production, you know, quicker than I think might be um, able. And so at least for me, and maybe other people don't bite off too much, but for me, you know, I, I feel like I was trying to do too much and, you know, school of hard knocks is a very expensive school, but very effective school by, you know, making mistakes. As long as you don't make the same mistake twice, you're doing fine. But I think, you know, I see, I, and I see farmers, you know, starting out now that they want to, you know, do a lot of things and just say, okay, well, this is, you know, maybe just look at what you think you can do and pare it down. You can always, you know, there's always next year, you know, if you feel like, you're bored. <laughs> have time on your hand. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and if you got, I always, I, I think too, if you got it right, you know, if you, if you got it right this year, now, you know, you can get it right next year. Right. And I know, guess instead of, instead of always being behind the curve. The other answer to that question would be to just think it through to the end when you do something. So if you're thinking of a new enterprise, just think about it. And again, a pencil on the back of an envelope, just to kind of rough out the big um, picture finances, just to get a sense of it before you start jumping in. You'll save a lot of time. Okay. And, and finally, what's, 
what would be your favorite resource? I mean, when you, when you run up against a problem on the farm, where, where do you turn, where do you turn for information? Well, I grew up before Google, I grew up before personal computers. And so, um, I think <laughs> this, this is a question that probably only works for people that are, that are my age and older, right. you know, but no, but yeah. I mean, but even so, even with, um, the access to the internet, one of our great things here in Vermont is a, the Veggenberry Growers Association as a list serve that, you know, professional growers all throughout New England, you know, read. And so if I have a question about, you know, grafting tomatoes or, something that I couldn't really find maybe online somewhere else. I just ask other growers or what's your favorite um, kale substitute variety or something for winter bore. And then, you know, you'll get a lot of different answers from a lot of professionals that, you know, you know, I think that's one of the biggest resources. And Vern Grubinger, I must say, is one of those resources in Vermont that we're very lucky to have. He's a UVM extension agent and, uh, just tremendous clearinghouse of information. So I would say th that resource kind of is probably the biggest um, help as a farmer. So what is your alternative for winter boar kale with this hybrid kale crisis that we're in right now? Broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> great. Richard, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you Same so here. much. It's been great talking, right. Chris. Okay. And uh, happy spring. Same to you. Okay. Right. Wow. I think it's so cool that I get to talk to farmers about their farms and the perspectives they bring to them. What a privilege. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I hope you're continuing to enjoy the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Well, okay. So wrapping things up here, you can find links from the show and more at farmer to farmer podcast.com. Just search for Wizwall. We got links to the books and to the resources he mentioned, even pictures of the tools that he commented on in the last couple of the last couple of minutes of the show here. If you're not already listening to this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice, I encourage you to subscribe to get new episodes as soon as they're released. And please, while you're there, take time to leave a review. It really does make a difference in how many people this show reaches. You can also leave comments for us on the show notes page of each episode. I'd love to know what you think about the farmer to farmer podcast about the individual episodes we're always looking for ways to make this better and if you like what you hear on the show please think about signing up for my newsletter the flying rutabaga at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purple pitchfork.com and one more thing if you've hung on for this long i'd like to know what questions you my listener have that my guests or i might be able to answer in the podcast please let me know on the facebook at, at purple pitchfork or use the contact page on farmer to farmer podcast.com anything about farming is fair game and if you want to be anonymous just let me know and i won't mention your name on air of course if you want to be anonymous don't post your questions on facebook use the contact page on farmer to farmer podcast.com Okay, now let's see. How do I turn this thing off? Let's see. I think it's this one here. Here. 